God is good. And all the time, God is good. All right, let's pray. Hey, God, uh, we just give you praise. Um, you know, as we celebrated uh, Christmas this past Wednesday, God, we think about uh, how you sent your son to come here in a lowly manger. Um, <laughs> And then to be on earth for 33 years and then to uh, hang on a tree um, for each and every one of us, even though we don't deserve it. Um, but to think about the sacrifice that uh, Jesus made on the cross, um, that's pretty awesome. And God, I just pray right now that you'll just bless the rest of the service. God, I pray that you will uh, be, with, be with Pastor Brian as he presents the message that you've laid on his heart. I pray that it will be your word speaking through him, God, and that uh, you'll touch each one of us here. Fill, our, fill us with your spirit, God. And uh, when, may, when we leave this place, uh, may we just be uh, so on fire for you that we, that, uh, that we just go tell everybody we know about you. Whether it's a saint or a sinner, God, a uh, friend or foe, that we'll just tell them about you. And uh, that 2014 will just be an amazing, amazing year. For uh, believers in Christ who went out there and just uh, started a revival, God. And it only takes a spark to get the fire going. I pray that when we leave this place, that that spark will be lit inside of each and every one of us. And that, uh, you know, the treasure valley will just catch on fire for you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the scripture for today is found in Matthew chapter 19. So, if you got your Bibles, you can turn there. Or if you just want to follow along on the on the uh, overhead there, we ooh that's on overhead, that's a long time ago. Uh, on the projectors. All right, beginning with verse twenty-three. Then Jesus said to his disciples, "Truly I say to you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel." To go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. Verse 25. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Well, then who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, now listen to this, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all, all things are possible. Hear the word of the Lord. You know what? I uh, We didn't dismiss them. Our children are dismissed for junior church. So our, our children and... I like to say people who act like them, but I would lose too much of the congregation. <laughs> Praise God. It is... We are just rejoicing, just stopping and thinking. Uh, this is not my sermon, so it doesn't count. You can just set your clocks back a minute. But uh, uh, it was so fun to see Sammy up there on the drums today. I know not for Ruthie, but... Yeah, he he has a brain tumor, and that's the reason that he was out. He's had he's had problems intermittently, and, I, and so that's a, um, so you know they the, they haven't decided what they're going to do about it yet. But he's decided he's going to play the drums, and I I just think you know um, I just praise God for the passion and the zeal of a man who says you know tomorrow is tomorrow, but today I'm going to praise the Lord. You know um I just thank you for that, Sammy. I appreciate your heart. Um. Well, I was looking at New Year's, thinking about all the different commitments that we make and uh, all the New Year's resolutions that are coming up. Everybody makes New Year's resolutions. I make the same resolution every year. Um, this year, I am not going to start smoking. Um, I like to make that commitment because I'm usually successful. Um, and I hate to fail. And so if I make other resolutions, sometimes they succeed, sometimes they fail. So I like to make one that will make me at least happy. Um, so I go with that one. And so far, I've been successful. 
I haven't started yet. So that's my commitment this year. But I, I know that a lot of folks are going to be making those ones, and uh, um, sometimes when you make those resolutions, it's kind of tough to keep them. Um, I, I, I read this story. Uh, a doctor was talking to his patient. A man went in for his checkup, and uh, uh, the doctor said to the patient, you are in terrible shape. You've got to do something about it. First, I want you to tell your wife to cook more nutritious meals. I want you to stop working like a dog. You're working too hard. Inform your wife you're going to have to make a budget, and she has to stick to it. Have her tell the kids to keep off your back so you can relax. Unless there are some changes in your life, you'll probably be dead in a month. Doc, the patient said, this would sound more official coming from you. Could you please call my wife and give her those instructions? <laughs> when the fellow got home, his wife rushed to him. I talked to the doctor, she cried. Poor man, you only have 30 days to live. Changes. <laughs> Changes sometimes come a little bit tough, and when you make them, it's, it's even harder to keep them. And I, I, I read something about this. It's in, uh, on New Year's resolutions. 80% of all New Year's resolutions fail. So you make a New Year's resolution, and 80% of the time you won't keep it. Even if you meet with moderate success, you're going to lose weight. You gain it back within the year. Um, and this was a quote by Thomas Kramer that I liked. It says, what the heart loves the will chooses, and the mind justifies. Can I say that again? What the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. The mind does not direct the will. The mind is actually captive to what the will wants. And the will itself, in turn, is captive to what the heart wants. So what you set your heart upon, your will is going to follow, and then you are going to justify that position mentally. You're going to justify whatever you have put your will to, whatever you have set your heart to. So if your heart is not in it, it's not going to succeed, whatever it may be. And I, I, I like the illustration of the camel going through the eye of the needle. Um, there's some who, you know, there's some of the scholars, there's disagreement on this passage as to whether or not it's really talking about an actual needle or a passageway into Jerusalem that was really crooked. That the, that the men would go through, and it was real hard to get through as an individual. It was like um, they had made this entryway, but in order to make it so that you could defend it rather easily, they had made passage like so it wasn't straight, because um, if you were trying to come in through a passageway, let's say you were an invading enemy and you were going into the city and you had to go through this crooked little area, you wouldn't be able to attack very rapidly, so it made it an entry, but it was a slow entry. You guys follow that? And so... Um, uh, that, that was called the needle, as they said, and that so for a guy to take a camel through that, it would be all but impossible to get an, a camel to make the, the crooks and bends and stuff. Um, um, truthfully, I don't, I don't care. I don't know if it was the, a little crooked passageway or if you're trying to shove a, a camel through a needle. I think the idea was is that Jesus was saying this is all but impossible to happen. He had just spoken to a rich young man who said, I'm not going to give up everything that I own, give it to the poor because I'm a rich man and I've got to hang on to this stuff. And Jesus says, and that's why rich guys are going to hell. You know, and his, and his, and his, his apostles, it's fun because then they say to him, well, who then can be saved? I, I wondered why they were asking. Who can be saved? I thought it was either one of two things. He says, rich men can't make it into heaven. Either, number one, they thought they were rich. You know, I mean, like, who could be saved? But in the next passage, they say, we've given up everything for you, Jesus. So, so that wasn't the idea, I don't think. But, when they, but maybe they were looking below, because everybody might think that, you know, do you consider yourself wealthy? Probably not. You know, um, I, I read this thing one time, talked about Michael Jordan and all the money that he made, you know, and that he could buy a new pair of shoes every 27 seconds, you know, and that he could, he could buy a new house every, every two days and all this kind of stuff. And then at the end of it, it said he only had to live for 217 years to make as much as Bill Gates in a year. You know, so, so poor Michael Jordan was poverty stricken compared to Bill Gates. You know, um, you know, so most of the time, if we look at the right people, we can think that we're poor. You know, we go, oh, I'm so poor. But if you look at the other people, you might think that you're actually very wealthy. So it depends kind of on whether you look up financially or you look down. So the disciples may well have been looking down at beggars sitting beside the street who didn't have anything at all. And they said, you know, we have so much. Look at how much we have. They may have been counting their blessings, which I think is really the most important thing for a Christian. But um, uh, they may have been thinking in that, in that mindset. 
Look at us. How are we going to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Because we're so wealthy. You know, um, so my, it might have been that. Or he may have been just saying, well, Lord, could you specify who is going to make it then? The wealthy aren't going to. Who is going to be saved? And Jesus said, nobody. Nobody is going to be saved except by the grace of God. With God, all things are possible. Without him, nobody's making it in. So um, I thought about that in, in context here. As we make our New Year's resolutions, what are you going to do? Um, first thing you're going to have to do, um, let me read the quote again, what the heart loves, will chooses, mind justifies. Um, and here was another quote that I liked a lot. The heart, I'm not, the problem is the heart, I'll get to that one. I'll, get, I'll go to the mind first because we're going to go with the easy part. Do you know why? Because changing your mind is relatively simple. It's real easy to convince the mind. You just throw a lot of facts at the mind, and the mind changes. You know, I, uh, Scripture, Psalms 119, I hate double-minded people, but I love your law. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So we've got to get rid of the double-mindedness. Uh, first thing. Um, and usually that's real easy. It's real easy. Somebody tells you you're going to hell. Once that sinks in, you know, when I first became a Christian, it wasn't because of my love for the Lord. You know, it wasn't. People say, you know, well, you know, you should serve God because you love Him, not because you're afraid of Him. That's good. That's good. But before that, before you love Him, before you serve Him because you love Him, be afraid. Be very afraid. I mean, really, seriously? Somebody who doesn't know God can't love Him. They can't. But once they understand the context of, of the fact is, I'm going to stand before God on Judgment Day, and I'm going to go to heaven or hell, that becomes a pretty strong motivator for me to dig a little bit deeper and to figure out what's going on. Until then, you kind of just stay stuck where you are. You don't really move. No new information, no new change, nothing going on that challenges you out of where you're sitting. Um, here's a, a great illustration for this. Um, it said this. The U.S. standard railroad gauge is four feet, eight and one half inches. So four feet, eight and a half. That's how far uh, apart, the, the, uh, that's the gauge, excuse me, of the, of, the, of the railroad. Why such an odd number? Because that's the way they built them in England, and American railroads were built by uh, British expatriates. So we did, did it that way because that's how the British did it. Why did the English adopt that particular gauge? Because the people who built the pre-railroad tramways used that gauge. They, in turn, locked into that gauge because the people who built tramways used the same standards and took the, t the tools they had used for building wagons, which were s set on a gauge of four feet, eight and one-half inches. So that's how wide apart the wagon wheels were. So that's how part the railroads were. Why were the wagons built to that scale? Because with any other size, the wheels did not match the old wheel ruts on the roads. So who built the old wh wheel ruts? You following this? Tracing it back. The first long-distance highways in Europe were built by Imperial Rome for the benefit of their legions. The roads have been in use ever since. The ruts were made by Roman war chariots. Four feet, eight and one-half inches was the width of a chariot needed to accommodate the rear ends of two war horses. So now you know why we, we, our railroads are gauged because of the size of the rear ends of war horses in Rome. Um, I, maybe that's a good reason, um, and maybe there was no reason to change it. But the problem is, when we get into a rut, when we get into one spot, when we stay right where we are, it's really difficult with ex without extra input to change that parameter. It's like going through, let's say you write a paper, and you go through after you've written it, and you proofread it. And then you catch all the mistakes that you made. You go, wow, I really made a lot of mistakes when I wrote that the first time. So then you go back and you read it again. Can I tell you that you can read it 5,000 times and after a while those mistakes that you made won't even look like they're mistakes anymore? You need someone else to take an eyeball on it and say, hey, look at this. The has a T in it. You know, um, you, know you guys have done this with spell check. If you've done anything on the computer and the computer corrects it for you, then you go back and read it and go, that's not right. Somebody else looking at something for you will often bring a different perspective. When that other perspective is brought into it, it changes everything. You can sit and think that you are right and think that you are absolutely perfect about everything and you'll stay there because you're thinking it through with the same mind. You need a different mind. You need somebody else. Sometimes it takes that other input. The mind is easy to convince. Mind is so simple to convince. Um, you can tell somebody, um, let me pick on some, the easy one is smoking. Smoking. Let's say somebody smokes. You say, smoking is bad for you. And they say, 
Yes, I know. It doesn't change anything. The information is still out there. They're completely aware of it. The mind is easy to convince. So then you think, so why do you do it? So why do you do it? And they would say, because the mind is subjected to the will, and the will is subjected to the heart, and I haven't changed my will or my heart. So Psalms 119, verse 12 says, My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. And uh, in Galatians 6, 9, it says, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. And sometimes, sometimes we grow weary, especially in the body. Um, scripture tells us not to be, yeah, you can see why he would be tired. Um, is, is sometimes, sometimes you grow t- tired, but when your heart is into something and you do something because you are passionate about it, even though your body is exhausted, even though everything about you is, is, is completely wiped out, there, I, I got to tell you that there is a really good kind of exhaustion. There's a really good feeling to having poured yourself completely into something, completely done it because your heart is in it and you really want to see something come to pass. That's exciting. I love it when I give all that I have got to give and when I'm done, I, I, I pour myself into bed at night knowing that I have done all that I can do for the cause of the cross. You know, that's a great feeling. You know, when you've given all you can. You know, um, so uh, New Year's resolutions. I thought, when we're going to make them, let me give you some questions of clarity. That's the next one. Number one, if you're going to make a New Year's resolution, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of that resolution? You know, um, everybody wants to lose weight. Not everybody. Some people are skinny, you know, and they don't want to lose weight. But people are not skinny, yeah, uh, want to lose weight. Why? Why? Is it because you want to be healthier? Maybe go to a gym, you know, maybe go to a gym, maybe walk. Just, you know, you can do stuff and be healthier. But if you're just trying, you know, I I need to lose weight because I'm trying to be People Magazine's sexiest man of 2014. Amen. But maybe I don't need to lose weight to do that anyway, you know. So if your goal is some, something dumb like that, if you're so absorbed in what people are thinking, then um, dump that. If somebody thinks you're fat and they say, hey, you're fat, just poke them in the eye with a pencil. Um, The scripture says if your eye offends you, cut it out. You know, it it didn't specify whose eye. Um, um, You know, so that would be easier. You know, um, because honestly, there's a point where it's just cosmetics and and our country is crazy. Our country is insane. And so you don't have to buy into that nonsense. So I, don't, I, I couldn't care less what you weigh or don't weigh. I, I, I truly don't. And uh, um, if somebody else does, they're, they're a pretty crappy excuse for a friend. You know, um, I mean, seriously. I mean, if, you know, there's a point of health. But beyond health, do something because your heart is into it. And if your heart's not into it, don't let somebody else push you, pressure you, or nothing else. Just carry a pencil with you. Um... <laughs> It's a lot easier than dieting. You know, um, you, you know, faster everything. You know, immediate results. Instant gratification. We should all be happy with that. Um, some of you will have to wear an eye patch, but, you know, it's the price. It's the price you pay. You do it because of you, if it's something you want, not because of something somebody else or something else, some, some other purpose outside of you externally. If, if, it's, if it's something there for you, which brings us to the second question. Who is this really benefiting? Whatever resolution that you make. Um, you know, I'm going to... Zig Ziglar said that it's, it's not as important that the, when you, what you get from achieving a goal as much as it is who you become. Do you follow that? Who you become. You, you know, um, a, lot of, a lot of self-help programs are, are geared towards money. You're going to get... You're gonna get you know, we, we, I've, I've, I've beat up Dave Ramsey for you. Um, I, I could go after Larry Burkett, too. Um, it doesn't make any difference. I, I hope that you're a bajillionaire and that you tithe. You know, um, yeah. <laughs> but, but, then, but, but what's the benefit of it? What's the benefit of it? Did you know that you can be really wealthy and that wealthy people will still go to hell? That's what Jesus said. So what's the point in financial gain? What's the point, in, even if it's just stability? And there are very valid and good reasons for it, too. As same as losing weight. There are very valid and good reasons for it. But you need to think it through. Whose benefit is this? 
Who am I doing this for? Am I just doing it for me? Is it really just a selfish, another form of self-gratification or self-glorification? Or, or do I have something else in mind with it, which keeps us going, uh, what price am I willing to pay? What price am I willing to pay? Um, that's, you know, sometimes it's a matter of resolve, and that's where the will comes into it. And I, once the heart's on board, um, when I went through nuclear power school, my chief caught me at the end of it. I, got a, I had a 2.74. That's not very impressive, guys. 2.5 was the minimum you could make and survive. It was 2.5 and survive. That's what we called it. Reactor principles tore me up. Man, I just could not hardly get it. It was, it was, it was like pounding, I don't know, pounding rocks. I just couldn't get it. It was real hard. I made it. I survived it. You know, um, my chief said, man, I didn't know if you were going to make it. And I said, wow. I had never up until that point even conceptualized the fact that I could fail. You know, I was like, oh, no, I, I was going to make it. You know, I got a 2.74. What are you talking about? I had 0.24 to work on. You know, I mean, I had all kinds of space there. You know, I was like a C plus. You know, you know um, but uh, um, I, it didn't even dawn on me. I, I just knew that I had to attain a goal, and so I just worked towards that goal. You go, well, what if you fail? You know, it wasn't necessarily arrogance. Maybe it was. Maybe it was arrogant to not think I could fail. But it was, it was that I didn't even consider it as a possibility. I didn't, I never even, I mean, it never crossed my mind. When he said, I didn't know if you were going to pass or not. I was like, oh, wow. I mean, it was a realization to me. Wow, you're right. I could have failed. I didn't even think of that. You know, it's like, you know, sometimes I think, I think that that's supposed to be your mindset. Is it, It's not that, like, you're going, well, what if I do win or fail? I think that you just commit to a goal, and when you sell out to it, you make it happen. And, and that's what you do. And you go, well, what if it's going to cost you more? Well, then it costs you more. You pay that price. Well, what if the price goes up? Well, you pay that price, too. You, do you know what I mean? Whatever it takes, that's what you do. And uh, um, I think that when you're committed to that, and when your heart is in it, you'll find that commitment available. You'll find that ability there, no matter what it is, you know. Oh, no, sorry. Last question, most important one of all. Some of you can't see it. Who gets the glory? Who gets the glory? Who's glorified by whatever your commitment is? Your New Year's resolution. Are people going to praise you, or are people going to praise God? Because I'm going to tell you something. If they're just praising you, um, you're missing the mark. You're missing all of it. From start to finish, you've already lost it. How many of you have already made New Year's resolutions? Anybody? Yeah? you made some? How many of you have made New Year's resolutions to pray a little bit longer? To spend a little bit more time in the Word? To give yourself a little more holy to the, to the cause of the kingdom? Oh, you're talking about weight, exercise, money, tangibles. We can get distracted by those things. I'm not saying they're not important. I'm not saying they're not important. I'm saying they're not the most important. The most important thing is where is your heart? Where is your heart? We got to dislodge it, man. We got to get it set on things above anyway. Don't get distracted. Let everything else glorify God. Okay, so here's, here's the one uh, pieces of advice for you. Ready? I'm back to the double minded man. Don't be, don't be double minded. Benediction. Nope. We are just not there. You had a good time with me today. Sometimes it happens. Um, computers are a wonderful blessing. <laughs> Here's something I would, I would commend to you. If you want to succeed at anything, don't go it alone. As iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. You know, um, whatever you're trying to accomplish, whatever it is, when you make any resolution, you've got to tell somebody about it. The devil loves to make those things in private. I believe that Christianity is best lived out in community. I believe it's only lived out in community. I don't even know if you can be a Christian without being around other Christians. I know I can't. I've tried it before. Um, and I know that I failed. When It was just the way it was at that time. If you are, if you are around other people and... The best benefit you can have from other people, I think, one of the great benefits, I mean, just encouraging one another, speak to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, speaking words of truth and life into one another's, you know, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ together. I think that the worship of our Heavenly Father is very valuable. Second thing I think that we can do for one another, hold each other accountable. Hold each other accountable. Man, I'm really struggling with something. Well, what are you struggling with? 
You know, I don't know what you're struggling with. You know, man, I, I really like stealing stuff from work. Well, that makes you a thief. You need to stop that or you're going to burn in hell. You know, okay. You know, thanks. Um, I'll let you know when I steal something so that you can chastise me again. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, those kind of dialogues need to happen. Those conversations are wonderful. Would you rather have a dialogue with that with somebody that you care about, somebody that is a friend, to tell you, hey, you got to stop this? Isn't that better than waiting to find it out on Judgment Day? You know, when you stand before God and God says, hey, you're going to burn in hell. I told you that, remember? You didn't pay any attention. What are you doing? You should talk to your friend. He'd have told you. you know, finding a friend. Somebody, to, if you, you want to succeed, tell a friend about it. And whatever New Year's resolution you make, make it something you can measure. Make it something you can measure. If you're going to pray more, then pray more. But write it down. I pray, I pray right now two minutes a day. I'm going to make it four. Pray right now four minutes a day. I'm going to make it six. I pray six. I'm going to make it eight. Whatever it is. Write it down. Document it. You know why? Because then when you go to your friend, you can look at it. You can share it with somebody. And it's something that's measurable and tangible that they can see. And you can be successful. Guys, you're trying to get a camel through the eye of a needle. It isn't going to happen easy. It's going to take a little bit of work. Uh, and the last thing, uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him and He will make your path straight. Cast all your cares upon Him. Um, ultimately, ultimately a holy heart is your primary goal. Ultimately, living a life for Jesus Christ is more important than anything else. And you know the funniest thing of it is, oftentimes we make commitments, we make decisions, we make plans, and God says, hmm, too bad I wasn't in those. You know, um, you got these plans. Those are cute. Um, now I'm going to tell you what you're really going to do. And I'm going to tell you what really matters. And then we find out that all of those goals and all those ideas and all of those plans that we had really were not quite as important as we thought they were in the first place. And the Lord redirects our minds and our hearts towards something totally different. So, so make your goals. Make your plans. Try. Try your best to serve the Lord and to do those things. Pat, ask for anything you want to just in case it's okay. Um, so, you know, that's her saying, not mine. I just stole it. Is, is, go ahead. Go for it. I, I, I hope that you're rich with 3% body fat, you know. Um, I don't know if that's what you want to be, you know. But uh, in all you do, just submit it to God. Submit it to God. And God's going to say, you know, that really doesn't matter to me. That's really not what it is. And I want you to know this. Wherever you're at today, I want you to know that God loves you exactly where you are. That you're His kid, and you don't have to do anything else but be His kid to please Him. So you do it because your heart's in it, and that's fine, and just pray that it's blessed. But I want you to know that you are good enough. Do you follow that? There might be some stuff that you need to get taken care of. You might have some issues between you and the Lord. He might say, hey, you know what, that whole cheating from your boss, lying on your taxes, stealing that whole pornography thing. Not too pleased about all that. God may point out some things that need to change, but I want you to know that He loves you. I want you to know that God thinks that you are really awesome today. He loved the world, sent His Son. That was all motivated by love. So whatever you do, God bless you. Find success. Be happy. Be joyful. Count your blessings. You know, and know that you're loved. You're loved unconditionally. It doesn't matter. I, I tell you that because the world tells you everything else. You know, but the world's not always quite as truthful with you as God is. You know, and I, I want you to know that you're incredible. No matter what, you're already there. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the love that you have lavished upon us, God. Without reservations, dear God, nothing held back, including your son Jesus Christ, who came and died for our sins. May, Lord, may we find our self-worth there, in the cross, God. Humble our hearts that we're not arrogantly standing before your throne, but, Lord, may we in humility kneel before it, and may we find your acceptance more important to us than the world's. God, may we, may, may we be grateful for all that we've received, not continuously discontent, seeking more, trying to change our circumstances because we're not content with who we are. Father, I pray for the self-esteem of your people first. I commit to you, Lord, those who have been beat up, God, by society, by their families, 
by circumstances, often beyond their own control. Lord, I pray that you would touch and that you would heal the heart. I pray that you would make these people, Lord, myself, all of us, Lord, know that we have value, merit, and that we are loved by our Father in heaven. May everything else flow out of that. May we find the fullness of your Holy Spirit within us to be the most gratifying and satisfying thing in our lives. May we not be led astray by a world that would tell us all kinds of stories and lie to us. Father, be glorified in our lives and in our hearts, our minds. Guide us, protect us, Lord, from the world around us, Lord. May we be focused more upon you than anything else. Have your will in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, my friends. Shake hands and be friendly.